Good morning. My name is Alek Tarkovsky. I work at the digital center, which we usually call Centrum Cyfrowe in Polish. We use the Polish word. I'm also a member and vice chairman of the Polish Coalition for Open Education. And I'd like to welcome you to the panel on opening up Poland. First, maybe I'll introduce um, our panelists. Uh, we had some changes at the very end, so the program might not be accurate. With us today, our professor Zbigniew Konkol, who already was introduced, he's a professor of physics here uh, at the university. And what's important, he's both uh, responsible for policy and for practice on open education. So we're very happy to have you here. Uh, secondly, Jan Kozłowski from the Department of Innovation and Growth at the Ministry of Science and Higher Education. Krzysztof Kamil Śliwowski, who coordinates with me Creative Commons Poland, is the chairman of our Coalition for Open Education. And Krzysztof Kurowski, um, who is director of the application unit of the Poznań Supercomputing and Networking Center, which is a public institution, part of the Polish Academy of Science, which was one of the leading partners of the big open textbooks project, because of which uh, Poland can be called one of the leaders of open education around the world. Thank you very much to all of you for joining our panel. Um, before we start the discussion, I'd like to make some introductory remarks. So first important thing to know is that we won't be talking how to open up Poland. Poland has already been opened. Uh, we have a success story to tell, but then you'll see that uh, we always try to come up with new ideas, how to move ahead, and um, probably we'll be also discussing how to do more. The reason for that, and you must know this, is that Poles have some problems with acknowledging success of our education system and it's success that goes beyond uh, open education. Um, Poland hosted um, last year a pretty big conference, international conference on, of educational leaders from 30 countries around the world and uh, the keynote speech was given by at that time Director General of the European Commission uh, Directorate on Education and Culture, Javier Prats Monte, and he told this story that when he uh, talks in Brussels with policymakers. There's one country that consistently doesn't believe Poland had educational success, and that's Poland. You know, we we insist we on <laughs> we we are modest. Uh, we uh, we know you know we always try to do more. So um, I'm joking a bit. I actually think we will be able to show that we have a success, but this is. Uh, Part also of a challenge being inside, looking at all the you know small details that we're facing, um, and switching the perspective to talk about the uh, the big things happening in Poland. That's what we'll try to do. We'll have a short round of introductory speeches by our panelists, but maybe I'd like to just set the stage and give you some basic information about how open education has been developing in Poland. I might be a bit biased uh, as I'm the member of the coalition, but I believe that the uh, shaping of the Coalition for Open Education in 2008 uh, was one of the first milestones. And it's important that it was a milestone on the side of the civic society of grassroots action. The coalition was formed by four institutional members. It was the Polish Association of Libraries, the Polish chapter of Wikimedia, Creative Commons Poland, and an uh, NGO called Modern Poland Foundation, whose president will be giving the keynote on the third day of the conference. And today the conference group, uh, the coalition group, Camille will probably talk about it, to 30 partners, institutional partners, including the AGH University. Um, and, and that was sort of the seed that started it, uh, that started a discussion on open education in Poland. Um, the next important step was a small project called um, Polish School, Włącz uh, Polska, Turn on Poland. It was a program for Polish schools abroad. We have a relatively large diaspora, uh, quite visible, for instance, in the United States. And we have a system of schools for the uh, Poles living abroad. And uh, one of the first significant uh, open educational resources was a set of uh, textbooks for these schools. And I always felt that this was significant. This was sort of a good lab to test certain solutions beyond the main educational system, uh, make some experiments that were at the same time, so to say, a foot in the door, as we say. So uh, you made the first step, and then you can point to it. And when um, uh, two years later, in 2011, the debate around textbooks in Poland started, and we started talking about opening them up, there was already a previous case to describe. And this, was, this is probably the most important project. It's called the Digital School. It was a complex project for uh, IT and education, for digital education, therefore the name. 
uh, which started as a project to introduce computers into school. You know, a kind of typical infrastructural intervention that's often criticized as being not good enough. And over a year of discussions, which involved not just the government, but also uh, experts from academia, from civil society, from educational organizations, this sort of blossomed into a much more complex project, which had four uh, elements. It had an infrastructural component, equipment, but it also included teacher training. It also included, to some extent, um, uh, connectivity issues. And uh, importantly for us, it included a resources component. This component was the big open e-textbooks project, a bit about which we'll be talking. I'm, I'm sure Krzysztof Kulowski will talk more about it since his institution runs the open uh, e-textbooks platform. And the project was initiated in 2000, early 2012, with the end date of 2015. So, in a way, meeting today in 2016, this is a very good time for us to talk about open education in Poland because a certain story arc, if you will, ended. Uh, we spent five years being uncertain as being Poland whether this will work. And a lot of people believe those textbooks were not be created, that there will be too big of a backlash from uh, commercial publishers that uh, p uh, then people start saying maybe public institutions which are creating the resources are unable to create textbooks. Uh, I believe uh, the, we all proved them wrong and today we have this platform. And in a way we're also therefore in a new moment where you can ask questions. So okay, when you have a a uh, big educational, open educational platform that provides open textbooks in digital form to all the students, what is the next step? One other thing I need to mention, all this is mainly happening at the level of elementary uh, and lower secondary education or what you would call K-12. In higher education, we have exemplary uh, universities like the AGH, but to be frank, they're uh, sort of relatively few of them. We have a very interesting story of digital libraries, which in my belief have been a driving force for a lot of these discussions on openness, on sharing of resources, on modern approach to digital technology and science, in education, in cultural heritage. Um, but somehow in the end, the story about higher year education in Poland, we're not there yet uh, the way we are with um, uh, with, with school education, maybe this is something uh, we can discuss. But mainly I hope in our discussion we can focus on sort of talking about the successes and lessons learned of the last five or seven years and talking about what's next. And now I would like to give the floor to our panelists and we'll have Professor Konko speak again and as promised he'll say a bit more about open education at this university. Uh. I think I would like to give some information about the progress in and development in open education at our university. Uh, our university has joined Open Education Consortium in 2011, but of course much earlier we have identified the necessity of introducing uh, of open education practices at our university. We knew it, we were building and promoting this for years, and in, it finally resulted in 2010 in the first in Poland open repository of open educational resources, books, courses, interactive programs, and so on. This was uh, the first step, but very important. We showed to the public that it is doable, that people are willing to do so. The next step, of course, we are not sleeping. For the coming years, we are trying to develop it. And we move from the, let's call it static, repository materials to the more dynamic system. This dynamic system was prepared uh, on the IT platform at our university. And it refers to the system in which you can create your own textbooks or course books from scratches. Now we've got, it's simply like building the house from the bricks. We are providing the bricks nowadays in two fields, in physics and mathematics. There are over 500 of such bricks. You can take them and combine them in any textbook, or you can incorporate it into your textbook in any way you want. Uh, you don't have to be a specialist in the IT technology just to use it. It's very simple and very clear uh, to use it. 
we, in this way, we can build an individual courses, which is very important. It will come in the in the following discussion uh, for the courses that are very unique. Nowadays, we have to open so many unique courses that are not supported on the market with the proper books. So then we can build it in the system. Of course, this open AGS platform is not the only uh, software that you are using. Of course, we use a Mo Moodle as a basic uh, e-learning platform. Uh, our um, e-learning center is offering uh, Mahara web applications to build uh, electronic portfolio or Redmine project management web application. We are using open meeting software for online training and web conferences. But I would like to uh, point your attention to the fact that we are not limiting ourselves to work with uh, students of the universities. We definitely want to go much wider. And we are preparing and developing special programs for the students of the secondary schools. This is the source of our students. We have to keep the contact with them. And let me mention our biggest and the newest project. This is called Educational Cloud. In the pilot phase of this program, 20 schools of our region were involved. In the full program, it's about 120 schools and students that are involved. And this is based on a direct cooperation with uh, Krakow Universities. AGH is the leader, and it's based on the open education materials, open access. What we are building? We are trying to build a new channels for delivering this open education and educational application, educational software. We got the multimedia communication with all the school, try to build not only the educational, but also the social community, just to join them, to exchange the best practices. What we try, basically, we try to introduce a new paradigm uh, to those schools, just to tell them how to use technology enhanced e-learning and open materials. And finally, I would like to say one thing about the educational system in Poland. We are a state university. It means we are supported by the public funds. Students in Poland are not paying a tuition at the public schools. And of course, education is extremely expensive. So somebody has to pay it, and the taxpayers are doing this. This money I distributed by the Minister of Science and Higher Education. And we think that our duty is that we will do something that this money will be given back to the society, that it will go to the society. And preparing the open education material and providing an open access to all our materials is the one way to do it. And I think all the public universities are supposed to do it. It seems to be our duty. And all the universities should follow this way because we think uh, uh, our society is spending a lot of money, and it's not a uh, very wealthy society still. So it's a big challenge and big effort for our community should have something back. And, and this is what we are doing, and we think it's, it's our duty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, um, OK, this is. Can you hear me? It's a very soft mic. Um, so we'll continue with the, with the round of presentations. I also wanted to say we'll have time for questions if you have any uh, later in our discussion. So um, staying at the level of higher education and, and academia, I would like to uh, now ask Mr. Kozłowski to talk about a bit broader context from the perspective of ministry, which uh, looks at open education also from the perspective of other things low, open, like open access and open data? Well, uh, first uh, I would like to stay a little uh, uh, with AGH. Uh, well, AGH uh, probably is uh, well the best university in Poland as concerned of application of knowledge triangle uh, uh, concept. Knowledge triangle, as we all know, uh, puts stress not only on uh, keeping a balance between education, research, and innovation, but require uh, uh, guaranteeing kind of uh, synergy between, uh, between them. And uh, one of the uh, most known fruits of uh, Knowledge Triangle are uh, startups. 
uh, made by or ma made together w uh, with students and alumni, and there are um, uh, s uh, several uh, s several example <laughs> examples of that kind. And uh, of course, it's n not the only uh, aspect of knowledge triangle in uh, this university. Uh, you have mentioned uh, some uh, some others. As concern of our ministry, I would like to briefly talk about uh, three issues. The first is. Uh, Open access, by which I understand open publications, uh, access to open uh, to publications. So, fo following not only European Union, OECD, UNESCO, and uh, other international organizations, but first of all, uh, relying on own re uh, reflection and uh, very very strong bottom up pressure by numerous uh, organizations, of which uh, Alek Tarkowski mentioned. Uh, just uh, just before, uh, mini previous minister uh, appointed group for open access, uh, which prepared two documents. The first are the di direction for development of open access in Poland. It's a kind of soft recommendation uh, addressed to uh, fund ministry itself and to funding ad agency as well as to universities and research group as well. And the second document is a plan of action, so a kind of co concretization of previous uh, strategy, addressed uh, mostly to the ministry itself and to funding agency. And in, it's in a plan of action we uh, are dealing with such a questions like planning, coordination, uh, training and information, uh, aggregation of metadata, Orphan repository, change of uh, criteria in uh, research performance funding, change of criteria in funding of research journals, and uh, many, many others. Uh, so uh, now it's time to um, implementation of a uh, plan of action, and uh, we do hope very much that it will be. Uh, our task for uh, upcoming months. Uh, the second uh, thing is that we plan to organize uh, in autumn a conference on open data and thus uh, initiate the other very important and uh, interconnected chapter of uh, open access. Uh, we decided to make it uh, together with CODATA, probably the most known uh, but not the only organization dealing with uh, open data. And we in invited to Poland uh, Geoffrey Bolton and Simon uh, Hudson, which uh, uh, chair uh, CODATA. They were extremely helpful to us. Uh, we plan to, uh, to uh, invite, uh, for this Polish conference, to invite many foreign guests from European Union, uh, Commission of European Union, CODATA, and other organizations. And uh, to invite uh, at this conference uh, people from academia, university and non-university institutes, libraries and repositories, business, government, and third sector uh, institutions. And uh, the further goal of uh, this conference will be to prepare a roadmap for uh, open data. So, so we uh, assume that uh, there will be other tracks compared uh, to uh, preparation of uh, uh, documents uh, concerning uh, open publications. Well, and the last thing is that we are trying uh, in the ministry thinking about uh, massive online open courses, but uh, well, just uh, we have started to, to think by which uh, I understand uh, some um, preparatory studies. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. If I may add just one thing, I think at the level of higher education, uh, you mentioned this, this bottom-up pressure, and this is interesting. Poland has um, some polls have some sort of knack for this kind of activities, and and we see our coalition started in 2008. But for instance, three years ago, a, a much more informal movement called the Citizens of Science formed. And now I, I don't know whether such. Um, phenomena happen in your countries in Poland. This is clearly something uh, special. This is a group of mainly young researchers, but 
you know, obviously the uh, it's a very varied group from all disciplines which feel that that's forming sort of a, a civic committee that formulates policy proposals to the government is a good idea. And what's even more, this, this, this framing of policy by such very informal uh, bodies with, with this very strong civic framing works very well. So the, the document prepared by this uh, group, the Citizens of Science, has been received very well. And over two years, they became a really strong sort of actor in policy debates. Uh, and what's for us important, this is not an open education or open access uh, activist group. Their goals are much broader. They're interested in the quality of education, in the way the scientific system functions, in the way their careers develop. But among a dozen or so uh, recommendations, open access and openness is there. So this is another thing I think that's important in Poland that we're able to build this cooperation that, for instance, our coalition works with this group and sort of supports them in this one aspect that we're very good at, uh, allowing them to have a position on this issue as well. And currently, we're, uh, a, a very similar group called the Citizens of Education is developing, and we can see the same pattern repeating. Um, I would like now ask, moving to uh, school level K-12 education, ask Kamil Szlivowski to talk a bit about um, his perspective. Thank you. So typically on this, those kind of panels, I'm the one guy from Poland who complains about the Polish myth of success, because I don't believe quite in a su such success story about uh, Polish openness, but uh, maybe this will allow you to better understand what happened in Poland. It's not that I don't believe in a success about digital school and openness in Poland, I kind of see it in a different way than just a success story. And I think Alec uh, mentioned uh, brief history facts about what happened in the last seven years in Poland. And I just wanted to add some uh, some points of of of, uh, of different axes that happened before uh, digital school and before Polish uh, the first the Open Polish project and the Turn On Polish uh, textbooks, uh, which were a lot of different stuff happening in uh, in open practice, not in openness on the, of education in K twelve or higher education, because wha what happened before coalition of open education even started it was years of trainings done by librarians by people uh, at universities by people from creative commons and other open movements and other open foundations in poland that went all around poland and just trained and talked about openness and you see the profits from that seven eight ten years after they started not at the beginning, and with the ICT projects, with a lot of big projects with uh, government or, or European funding, you kind of think that the profits will happen at the second or third year, and then you want to see the, what, what the changes. But it doesn't happen in a, in a such way in K-12 education, especially in K-12 education, because the changes happen very, very slowly. Uh, and there's a, this, it's not a, you cannot do a revolution in K-12 education. You can do a very slowly evolution and then try to figure out if you can even see the changes because they are, f they are happening very, very slowly and gradually. It's kind of different, difficult to even track the, th the changes. So uh, maybe be I'm complaining because I'm based in open practice. So I don't uh, just want to see the regulations, the money flowing to open education resources. I want to see real changes that happening at the teacher's level and student's level. And uh, maybe this is why uh, Polish Coalition for Open Education and myself uh, is often uh, trying to speak about new stuff. Not only the success we did, like with dig the digital school and with a lot of requirements, because Alec mentioned digital school, but uh, probably even the better story that you don't hear about Poland is, is not just the digital school. The digital school is the biggest pro program. But uh, we try to track smaller programs, smaller competitions that have been different ministries and different public and private grant funders. And probably uh, this is why you are thinking about Poland as one of the best success story in openness because we don't have just one big program. We have probably 20 different programs in different ministries and public and private both um, uh, companies who are funding open education resources in different fields from cultural education to higher education, K-12 education, media literacy, whatever. Uh, so a lot of stuff is happening, but just part of those programs really influence what's happening in schools. And this brings me to uh, one problem, why we are still complaining, because just after we ended working at the digital school and with the governments, 
we started working at copy for copyright reform. So probably this is why we are uh, right now still in, in, in work. We are not uh, just uh, partying after having all those regulations in, in digital school and, and whatever, because we just moved to the European Commission and start working about uh, and working with, with European Commission to, to push forward even smaller chunks of possible copyright reform uh, in educational area, which is of course very, very difficult, much more difficult than just pushing, uh, just pushing open education resources and money uh, to OER projects. Because of course European Union is funding a lot of OERs, but is not making any progress at the copyright reform level, which is very difficult because fair use and open education resources are not enough. So I think we should be honest with ourselves, this is not enough, both in health education and both uh, in uh, higher education. This is not enough and it won't be enough if we push even further into 3D printing and different technologies in K-12 education and in higher education because they are, they are breaking the barriers of what is allowed by law and this will be a problem of next few years for a lot of, uh, a lot of teachers and a lot of universities. So uh, the open practice right now is happening, uh, of course, and it's happening for years right now, but uh, what's happening in open education resources that we are not seeing the different consequences of different types of getting to OER as the result of our project. And this is why probably after digital school and after all those projects, Alec already mentioned, uh, right now we are trying to experiment more with OERs and with open policies. We try to experiment if it's possible to open practice and openness happen from the bottom, from the teacher's level, even from students' level, not just from the government level when it's funded, when it's well structured, when it's planned to have a success in the next three years. So that's my belief that is also very important, but I'm trying to think about stuff that can happen in schools and then be brought up as the best practice in open, as the best practice to, to create open education resources. So right now Coalition for Open Education is even maybe thinking about kind of getting back to the roots, to the community building, uh, to the stuff that was at the beginning the most important for us. So trying to figure out who is making open education resources, who is trying to innovate in education and in openness, and bring the best practice uh, and show maybe the best practice to the government and then tell this is what you should be founding in the next few years. This is how you should do the openness, do the open education resources. It's not only about having a lot of money for OERs and a lot of different open policies. Open policies are very important, but they should include skills, practice and competences of teachers because this is what's uh, making the change in edu education. And I think this is very important to have this kind of discussion again, because I think we, we, missed, we, we missed sometimes uh, talking about what's happening in school, but not only in a systematical way, but at a very low level of what's happening between teachers and students. Uh, so maybe that's my uh, complaint, but I think uh, it should be useful for you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Krzysztof, we, we've been mentioning quite a bit the, the digital school project and the open textbooks project, but I feel uh, maybe we think it's too obvious for us uh, and, and the participants don't know. So I hope that you can say a bit about the project and your perspective uh, from as, as the leader of a key institution running this project. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Uh, okay, uh, so, so good, good morning, everyone. Um, so um, I was asked to in, in five minutes to talk about uh, a project which uh, uh, more more than five. Okay, so so uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, thank you so much for for for, for the invitation. I'm I'm very really glad to, to to be here to 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 share some experiences, uh, especially from 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 technical perspective uh, in one of the 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 biggest I guess. Uh, Open uh, educational uh, uh, project for K12 uh, in Europe or in the world, actually. So, um, but uh, so uh, I was thinking, you know, uh, uh, about the, the the most important things that that happened over, over the last uh, three years, actually, because we 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 started officially in March 2012, and uh, I think uh, apart from technology. Mm, I've learned that, that in this project the most critical uh, uh, 
uh, issue was trust because uh, and engagement because uh, more than uh, 400 people were actually uh, involved uh, in uh, in this project and uh, for us as a public institution uh, the, the critical moment was that uh, we uh, have been invited to this project as a public partner because uh, uh, there was a big de uh, public debate you know uh, how to organize the, this project so at the end in this project, uh, we had uh, three big uh, universities and one uh, private company, one uh, publisher, and uh, we as a, as a uh, technology uh, provider. So um, at that time, uh, I remember the f uh, one of the first meetings that, that we had uh, in Ministry of Education when I uh, uh, had to convince people that, that, that open educational resources uh, have been delivered to end users not in the form of CD-ROMs or USB sticks because three years ago many people were actually talking about delivering uh, open educational resources on, on, on CDs or memory sticks. So I said now that the, the main medium uh, for delivering content will be internet. And uh, <clears throat> so what that, that was the, one of the, the, the first uh, technical assumptions. Uh, this, uh, the, the second thing that uh, I had to explain that we don't want to build another Facebook. So we said that uh, if we want to build a platform for uh, uh, open educational resources distribution, uh, we have to have some unique features uh, and uh, enable um, people using different platforms, including uh, Facebook, easy integration. So that was the second important thing. Then <clears throat> the Ministry of Education said that, you know, this is the pilot, but you have to cover 40% uh, of the whole population. So that was, you know, the first pilot project, which actually cover 40% of the whole population. Uh, so I said, okay, it's, 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 a, it's a big uh, challenge. But, but uh, the, the Ministry of Education uh, said that, you know, it's not, not only uh, building uh, open educational resources, but all those uh, 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 open educational resources must be also approved by Ministry of, of Education. So it means in Poland that uh, that all e created e textbook uh, uh, went through the official evaluation uh, uh, procedures, and, and they said, "Okay, you, you have only three years because that's the the, the end of the uh, the, the European." Uh, funding period, uh, so we also that was you know the, the deadline, the, the another push uh, for us. So um, then uh, I think another important issue uh, was we have many experiences with with uh, technologies, different technologies, and uh, uh, we know by experience that the technologies change and. We said, okay, uh, one of uh, important assumption uh, will be to separate data sources from presentation layers. So uh, we force uh, authors of, of open educational resources to deliver uh, sources, and the platform uh, actually uh, creates in, uh, on fly uh, different formats for uh, for users. So uh, you can get access uh, from web browsers, uh, but you can also get access from mobile apps or uh, uh, generate uh, PDFs. So for us, it was really important to keep uh, high quality uh, data sources um, in this project because uh, we know that technologies will change and the platform and the content is prepared uh, to be uh, used uh, in the future. Then I think uh, I was sh really shocked to see that uh, there are no uh, uh, solutions for uh, disabled uh, people in the uh, digital form. So we also uh, uh, did some experiments and uh, we managed to uh, create data sources to be able for some, uh, some material, create um, mm, uh, digital uh, files in a braille uh, language because uh, there's no automatic uh, way to transform uh, even uh, text-based uh, digital material into to braille available as an open uh, platform and open resources. So we also experiment with, with that and uh, 
then the offline was really important because not all schools are well connected in Poland. I know that in the States especially, it's, it's opposite. I mean, the, um, many schools uh, do have access to, to, to high-speed internet. And uh, in Poland, uh, we are trying to catch up with this also. And I, I think we will, in two, three years, we will uh, change the, 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 the current situation. But uh, the, the offline scenario was also important. So um, we also uh, uh, wanted to give uh, public access to teachers and, and kids. And uh, we've observed that, that uh, many, many people are actually using the, the open educational resources, not necessarily at school, but uh, at home. Uh, and uh, we uh, uh, didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So three years ago, we were uh, looking for similar projects in, in, in Europe. And uh, we end up in some discussion uh, with uh, UNESCO. And on the way to, to some conferences, I visited Rice University and, and people from Connections. Not sure if the, there's someone from Connections from Rice University. So, uh, so uh, we, uh, I remember that the first meeting when I said, you know, guys, uh, you have really many experiences. And we would like to, to, to at least use some schemas and your uh, your experiences because it doesn't make sense to, to, to push or to create new standards. And, and they said, yeah, yes, I mean, there are some of schemas, but we are actually in the face of uh, re-implementing our platform. So you can use schemas, but the, the, uh, there are not too many software components that, that you can use. So, so we actually uh, had to uh, implement from scratch ma ma many uh, components, uh, but uh, we Mm, we really wanted to keep as many open standards as, as possible because uh, I know that, that, that in many, many educational um, initiatives uh, uh, when people create platforms and they use some technologies and, and uh, have commercial partners that then not all of them are actually uh, willing to really have open interfaces. And for us it was really critical because uh, uh, the way the open education are, are used uh, today, uh, apart from our platform, we see many, many schools, uh, websites, uh, uh, school websites, so based on Moodle or, or other you know, uh, platforms that link to, to, to our platform, or many people uh, taking our uh, resources uh, through APIs to use internally on some platforms. So uh, these are key you know, uh, assumptions and, and lessons learned uh, from the uh, last three years in five or seven minutes. Thank you. And one key piece of information ab about the scale of this project, maybe we, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, if you're not aware, this is a, a national textbooks platform. So this means it covers the whole core curriculum for classes K-12, so both for uh, primary schools, for uh, middle schools and high schools. Um, and um, what was also important that we, we said, and I'm saying we because it was a discussion that was done together by representatives of public administration and sort of the civil side, uh, a strong standard for openness, which I think is can be seen as sort of a model solution. It's a, it's a standard first that assumes open licensing using a Creative Commons attribution license. Secondly, uh, it assumes an open format, so the content has to be available in at least one open format no matter what kind of content, be it text or video or graphics. And, and thirdly, the accessibility issue is important. And, and to be frank, as you said, this is very challenging, but the general uh, assumption is we're, we're not fully there, uh, but that this will meet, for instance, for online content, WCAG standards. And I think even the commitment to do that as part of sort of open thinking was an important step. So we went beyond the simple argument about licensing. Can you say just a bit about, I know it's the, the, um, the platform has been running only since uh, December, so it's three months, but can you say a bit about the scale? Because that was the, the challenge in Poland when the government said 40% of, uh, of teachers and therefore of the population, because of also of students will use it. Uh, the Poles didn't agree. Some said uh, it'll never happen 
because it will be 100%, you know, the market will be destroyed. No one will want to buy textbooks. But the other half said, it'll never happen because it'll actually be zero. Because there's no connectivity, people are not interested in your resources, teachers are conservative and like their printed books. So where are we after these three months? Okay, so uh, the first comments, uh, because uh, our policy was also uh, since the beginning that to, to be open as much as possible. So we, we first we invited many schools, many teachers. Uh, we actually uh, discuss uh, the, the interfaces GUIs uh, uh, with end users. But the, one of the first, so, so and then we also, uh, as you remember, uh, we uh, we didn't want to 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 wait for all complete e textbooks. So the, the policy was simply you know, to uh, little by little gradually uh, publish. Uh, uh, open educational resources to see you know, reactions and also see uh, and, and collect comments. One of the first comments that we received was actually not from Polish teachers. We received many positive comments from from uh, uh, maybe you know wives of uh, Americans, <laughs> uh, but you know uh, happy people, teachers that are abroad and and they they they, they really uh, were happy that they have access to complete e-textbooks in, in an uh, easy, uh, accessible uh, way. and uh, <coughs> But it wasn't enough because, as I said, we had to cover 40% of uh, all teachers and all kids, which is roughly uh, 2 million kids and uh, around 200,000 uh, 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 teachers. So, <coughs> as you can imagine, even if uh, there was a uh, uh, marketing uh, uh, campaign uh, supported by the officially supported by the Ministry of Education, even in the national TV broadcast. Uh, we've observed, you know, gradually more and more, more uh, users interested in in the, the the open educational resources, but uh, the, the 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 peak that that we receive uh, or we observe was actually when Ministry of Education uh, decided through of official, official channels uh, uh, to ask teachers to try to use open educational resources. And they said, you know, you have one week to do some experiments. So then all schools in the whole Poland actually uh, wanted at the same time, actually at 8 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> uh, get access to open educational resources and at that time we had uh, more than five million uh, visits uh, per day, which was quite a, a challenge also for, for the infrastructure. But the, um, luckily, the, the, the platform and the, the resources are distributed through uh, high uh, speed uh, optical network and hosted on the, 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 the big, 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 uh, really big uh, computing cluster and storage facility. So, but it was a challenge. Uh, and uh, after that, I think, um, as you said, uh, takes time to actually uh, maybe not convince teachers to, to use, but to, uh, to change also the way or the change, you know, the, the data sources they are using for, for teaching. Uh, I think in May or uh, June, uh, they have to decide uh, what uh, books or e-textbook uh, they can, uh, uh, they will use for, for, the, for the next uh, semester and uh, all uh, e-textbooks uh, uh, for all uh, K-12 levels, uh, as I said, have been uh, officially approved by Ministry of Education. So, so I expect that many teachers will actually decide to use uh, uh, to use e-textbooks. The funny thing that we've observed that we've got many many questions asking, you know, um, for giving them uh, access code, you know, and it's it's because uh, the private companies simply you know. Uh, uh, provide a limited access to, to, to educational digital resources. So they didn't believe that you know, it's, it's, it's public available. And you know, uh, we had to use the argument that it was you know, publicly funded, so it's public available without access. You, you, you don't have to even uh, log into the platform. I mean, if you log in, you have extra features, uh, but you don't have to uh, um, have an account. You don't have to have any access code. It's simply you no know, public available. But they <laughs> didn't believe. I mean, it was uh, uh, shock. So, so, uh, so as I said, um, 
uh, currently it's, it's uh, um, I think more than uh, 50 million definitely visits uh, and uh, I keep fingers crossed you know for, 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 for the future we'll have to maintain the the, the, the platform but uh, the, the, the Ministry of Education is planning also to uh, add additional uh, digital um, educational uh, resources also thinking about new new courses so we will uh, do our best to, to support uh, those activities. Thank you very much. Uh, Krzysztof, you started talking a bit about the, um, the impact, how it's being used. I think this is a, a sort of a key moment where we are, I even personally feel that for a very long time our work is focused on the provision of resources. What we really wanted to achieve is just to see some open resources available. And that, that was, a, I think, an important sort of goal to have, but, but now having these resources, it's a lot more question about the impact, w and most significantly, is there impact on the quality of education? Um, so I wanted to ask you that, and maybe starting with Professor Konkol, uh, in a way your repository, as you mentioned, is one of the oldest resources, and you have uh, therefore uh, at least several years of experience with this functioning within your university. Can you say a bit about how you see this impact? Uh, you have to view it from the two points of view, uh, teachers and students. Students are, are welcoming all these resources very warmly. They're using it. Uh, 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 for one year I was checking how many times my book was just downloaded. It reached like 40,000 per year. So people were using it. But I would love, the question was, one of the, uh, uh, one of the sentences was that when we are dealing with this education, open education materials, and we want to improve our access to this, we are facing uh, different troubles, different problems, and the question is, well, is it good or not? Or if it's so good, why it's bad? So at this point, I, I have to mention two fundamental problems at the university with the open education. Both are from the point of view of the teachers. One is our system of the, of the career at the university. The other is the mental barrier for the teachers. The first one is very simple. If I want to have a better position at the university, if I want to be a professor, I have to publish as many papers as I can and as fast as I can. I have to gather the money to the university through the project grants. Honestly, I don't have much time to work on uh, educational materials. That's obvious. And uh, what counts in my career, how many papers I do have, how many citations I do have, how many money the university has from my projects. That's the key factor. And my uh, educational resources do not have such an impact on my career. So we are not encouraging the people to do it. The other thing is the mental barrier. Uh, people are, you know, know that if they will go open with their materials, they are also open for the criticism for the other people who are around, other teachers. Usually the criticism comes from the people who didn't wrote uh, even a single book or didn't prepare even a single upper educational material, but it's a fact. If you are teaching in uh, four walls, okay, you are interacting with the students and you are open to the criticism of the student, but that's all. It's not coming public. When you are going public, the situation is completely different. And people love to be in the situation that there is no criticism with respect to your activity, because after some time, you are coming to the conclusion that you are not making any mistake errors, that you are perfect. Nobody's criticizing you, so it has to be that you are ideal. And of course, these are the two barriers. The model of the, the, model of the uh, career at the university and the other, this barrier. So as a result, I think that to say what's the impact of the open education of, on the quality of our education, we have to look two ways. First. It's not that great because the number of the people that are involved in the open education uh, uh, practices is limited still. It's too low, definitely. 
So we can't estimate really uh, seriously what's the impact. We don't have that many people involved in this. The other is we, what it means. We, we have to work on it, of course. We have to promote it. We have to say to them that it's very important to their career. The other thing is when you're talking to the students, they are sometimes even disappointed that there is not enough of an open educational resources. That the open access to the um, materials at the university is not satisfying them. So I would say that's the one thing. And one thing that I would like at the end say, okay, we are at the technical university. And I have to say it. The language we are using in the education of engineers and in a basic sciences like mathematics, physics, chemistry, we are using a mathematics language, which is not easy to communicate. It's not very narrative. So we have to take also some correction for this, what I've said. To prepare the materials for engineers, it's not easy. The materials that they can easily follow. The, you, it's not easy to build a dialogue in the mathematics language. So we see some barriers coming from the system. We see some barriers coming from the people and from the fact that we are at the technical university. But I strongly believe that the key factor is the promotion of this. We have to convince the teachers that it's good for them to go public. All my mistakes, all my errors um, in my books were caught in the first year. The people were writing to me, I make improvement, and my book is much better than it was, let's say, 20 or 15 years ago when I started. So um, you have to show the advantages. I would say, no matter what people will say, the impact of the open education on the quality of education will go up, definitely and we'll see it soon. And the people who will not go with us, they will soon be somehow excluded from, from the teaching. I don't say that we have to go 100% for the open education. Usually we do a blended system. But that's obvious. We, you can't do laboratories in, at the technical university using uh, online web materials. You have to touch the experiment. But if you want to really help the students, just go for that. And that's how we see it from the point of view from, from our university. Those three things. First, the, the way we advance at the university. So it's the system barrier. We have to change it. The other way is to, how we have to change the mental approach to the open materials from the teachers. And the third one, we have to activate the students that they will show to the teachers that they are expecting such uh, resources. Thank you. I need to ask you one thing, sort of a personal thing. So, and I agree that there are all these barriers to becoming a creator of open resources. And without these creators, and Kamil talked about it, we don't really have open education. Yes, you can probably ask some companies to create resources for us, but that's not the same. So why did you create these open textbooks in physics? You won't believe it. It, it. The story was like that. I wrote the first book, and of course it was a classic book in the early 90s. It was printed, and was brought to the bookstore, and it was sold. So two companies asked me to write the next edition of the book, improve it, and, and so on. And I said, OK, well, I will write the book, and uh, I will bring it to you. And I don't want any money for that. I'll give it for free, but there is one condition. On the shelf in your bookstore, the cost of the book should be lower than a Xerox copy of the book. And they say, you must be crazy. It won't happen. I say, why? I will give you the whole text, camera ready, with all the drawings, all the graphics. It's ready for printing. It's made professional. So why are you hesitating? I say, no, no, no. And they, then they start to count how many companies are on its way, and distribution, and so on. And what other cause I say, okay, forget it. I'll bring it and, and put it into the internet. I would start it. Then the reaction, so it was a kind of uh, anger that brought me to this point and disappointment from, uh, from the reaction of those editing companies. But then 
the reaction for the, from the students was so enthusiastic that I say, okay, that's the way to go. And um, I am a fan of education, so I think that's the primary role of the university. The primary role of the university is an education. The science is the motivation for it, but it's not the primary. And we don't have to forget it. And unfortunately, because the money stays behind. So we are in the position that, and I am doing the same, I've got five grants, uh, I'm publishing all the time the paper, sometimes I'm very surprised what I have written in, in this paper, but that's, that's a separate story, not, not for today's discussion. The reason was very simple, it started in a strange way, but then I see the reaction from the students, and that's what I'm talking to our teachers, do it, and the reaction of the student will go sometimes beyond your expectations, do it. And, uh, and then how it's happened. So, but nobody's perfect, so remember that. If I can add something, because I totally agree, and this is the same situation in K-12 education, it's, uh, it's a matter of motivation of the authors to create and open their materials. And uh, one story, because like two, two weeks ago I was in a study, at a study visit in the Rijks Museum. You probably know Rijks Museum in, in Amsterdam. This is the best success story of, of glam, open glam sector right now, probably. And they told us about what were the beginnings of their opening all the collections and pushing to the public domain mark and CC0 and making all the collections digital and available in the highest formats possible. They can send you TIFF, 400 megabytes uh, for free. They don't, uh, they don't even uh, don't want to have a recognition of the museum. So you don't have to even attribute the museum, you just attribute to the author of the public domain. So they're like the, the, the best practice right now. And they, they, they they told us about two stuff, the, the two things that that, that, they, that that made the whole museum and the staff uh, being for the change, for the openness, and it was simplicity and benefits. So they counted money, and they saw that the benefits for the museum will be to publish the whole process, the workflow, uh, as being for the open materials, for the public domain, not just a workflow for selling those digital copies. And this was the benefit. It was cheaper, it was better, it was faster. So it was better for all the stuff. And the second one was, uh, uh, if, it's, if, if, we, if we can see the benefits, and we will have more money at the end of the year without all those stuff we need to sell the digital images. We can just have more money with putting those images online for free and open, it will be better. And then the, um, the simplicity, they were searching for something that will be the easiest way to make their mission at the, at the core. So their mission as a museum is to make those stuff, may, 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 may not make the pa paintings available, but to promote the, those paintings. And they just saw, okay, this is the openness at the, as the level where it's simple and it's benefiting the institution. So if we can see benefits and simplicity in institutions, we should see the same for teachers and for creators. They need both to see the benefits of openness and they need to see how it's making their life simpler. If it's not making their life as a teacher or as an author simpler and they don't see any benefits, they won't do it. And this is the part which, where it's the most difficult because this is different in different countries. You go to uh, Belgium, they have different motivational um, programs for teachers than in Poland and in different countries. And then it's not only about money because sometimes it's about attribution, sometimes it's about some cultural stuff. The teachers in different countries need to be motivated. And we are not talking about this. We are talking more and more about values or policy. And we are not talking how policies and values should resonate with benefits, personal benefits of the authors, of teachers, and of academics. Thank you. There, of course, there's nothing wrong when the, when the teachers are making the money. But the, the story goes goes different way. What, what we are talking, we are thinking also about the students. They have to say to them, okay, you have to learn at my physics course from five, six different books that you have to buy in the store or to get it from library. And this part comes from here, this part from here. It's much easier to prepare your own textbook. But, but that's my point of view. But the other story goes like that. We've got enormous amount of unique courses that goes for three, four years because of the, the world is demanding from us, the outside world is demanding to start such a courses. For example, we've got the only one in the Europe faculty of drilling oil and gas, dealing with all these problems. So there are not available materials 
at the market. So people are writing their own books, but they are writing it in a different way. Of course, they're preparing the textbook, and they are making them available through the open access through our library. But it doesn't ha it's not on the Creative Commons license. You can read it, but you can't copy it. You can't take any part. You can't use it freely in the sense. So you have to distinguish between this, what our academics are doing when writing a textbook. They're, most of them are putting this book in the digital form on our uh, library platform, but it's only read-only text. It's not able, like my book, anybody can take any part of it, borrowing picture, text, and can do whatever he wants with it. It's a different approach. We have to understand it, that some of the teachers are, are willing to, maybe they are afraid of the competition, I don't know. But you have to look at this, that is a long time process. We have to convince them. But all the environment is trying to do opposite way, to say, forget about the classes, think about the science. And what's more important, I have to say that I am vice rector responsible not for their education, I am responsible for the science at this university. But even though I have to admit that education is the number one. Thank you. But Maybe just uh, about the, the, the impact. I, I forgot to mention, but uh, there is uh, what we've been observing. There is a, uh, a real concrete uh, impact also on the on the on the on the market. I mean, on the, uh, I remember a few years ago, uh, as you also mentioned at the beginning, there was even you know big fight you know between you know the the the, the you know, paper business and you know the the, the open uh, access initiatives. Uh, and uh, uh, we have been observing that we actually uh, at the two, two two cents you know to stimulate the digital uh, educational market. Because uh, there are some companies asking, you know, for the the open educational resources, and they would like to improve the the, the quality of, of the, the 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 resources and sell to to you know to for instance to teachers. And if the if there are some teachers who are willing to to, to pay, I mean, I, I don't see, see any conflict. I mean, as long as uh, we also have many many teachers uh, receive thousands of of comments uh, remarks. To the the open education resources, but trying do uh, doing our best, you know, to fix uh, typos or, or change change the content. So it's an ongoing process. But uh, I, I see, you know, the, 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 the you know also the, the impact, real impact on a digital uh, educational market. So uh, that's our you know uh, experience, you know, since you know uh, we we launched in, uh, officially the, the e textbooks. If I can add to that, I think that was during the last five years a, a very important and different discussions we had in Poland about resources in a way uh, as a market goods. You know, it's it's you know it would be nicer to just talk about educational resources as as, as teaching materials, but they, there is obviously a market component and a big debate in Poland. The policy debate was about how to shape this relationship between open resources and markets. And again, I think we're, uh, we made big progress. So we, we moved from a, a space around 2011 where even our coalition would have really heated debates with publishers to a space where at the end of last year and over uh, this winter uh, and also together with Krzysztof's institution, institution we built this working group where we had IT companies, we had uh, the best schools using IT technologies, we had public institutions, we had our coalition but we also had the publishers and we were able to write a shared document on, on the model of a digital school which included language around openness which was shared which was a big advantage. I think the reason this was possible that um, this is also a big change that happened. Poland moved from a model where parents pay for textbooks to a model where they're publicly subsidized. And this is actually the model that dominates in Europe. I don't know how that is abroad if, if you're beyond, if you come from beyond Europe. But in a situation where there is a provision of funds to the market, of course the publishers will always want the subsidy to be bigger. But once you sort of negotiated at a certain level and there's money to be made, they will, I think, accept the open model because it becomes complementary. Uh, if you ensure them that there will be uh, funding uh, for the public resources. And I think that's a big sort of question for the future, whether that's really the case, that we can have a complementary system of printed commercial goods and online or, or 
digital commercial goods and open online goods. I think we're, we're even as our coalition, we're changing our approach. I think at the beginning, there was a lot of discussion that you can move to a fully digital, fully open system where these will be publicly funded, publicly available resources on the internet. One of the sort of first uh, moments we realized that's not that simple is the connectivity issue, which you already mentioned. And I think this, for me personally, this was interesting. I remember when I read the Paris Declaration, and there's a big part in Paris Declaration about availability of internet in educational institutions. And I felt, you know, this is not open education. We want to be talking about licensing and, and legal aspects. But I grew to realize this is crucial and in a way, Today, I think you cannot separate open from digital. And in Poland, uh, really, we and, and this is, I think, actually very good. We're reaching a point where debate on open education is a debate on, edu on digital education. So for instance, when the government declares that by 2020, they really want to fix the situation of elementary schools and provide high-speed connectivity, hopefully fiber, to every school, which is not the case today. We feel that's a very big change, not just for education, not just for digital education, but also for open education. But I need to add that the challenge there is that people tend to forget about the open part. We did some uh, research on how to, to talk with people about open. and. Uh, and talk about these changes that are happening and we realize it's very easy to talk, tell people about digital education. They can sort of understand what it means that you can have a textbook in a tablet or a textbook that's available at home on the internet. But explaining to them that open bit, the fact that it's reusable, that it's elastic, that it gives some freedoms, that sort of gets sort of lost, we felt, in the in the, the, the translation, just to be very blunt, we did a picnic, an educational picnic, where people could throw bundles of textbooks, you know, like the way they do at the Olympics, the, uh, the hammer throw. Uh, and that gave them a real clear sense that the, it's not going to be heavy anymore. But how do you illustrate at a picnic that it's going to be open? That's challenging, but maybe you have some thoughts about this, because that's also the question of how to involve, be it academic researchers at university or teachers, in an open textbooks platform. And this is what Camille described, the challenge we're facing. So what are your ideas, how we can improve this engagement? So um, I think uh, th there are many issues. Uh, first, uh, from a research perspective, I think uh, it's a completely uh, uh, new world. I mean, y you cannot imagine uh, working with kids, you know, what kind of expectations they have. To be honest, they don't want to read about uh, exercises. They, they want to do exercises. So uh, with Internet of Things, uh, with uh, completely new software delivery uh, models, uh, uh, we have realized that we actually have to have open, we call it a future school laboratory, so open space. When, uh, when we are designing or building uh, new solutions for using uh, virtual reali reality, augmented reality, sensors, uh, etc. then we have to re be really, really close to, to kids and, and teachers. And then you actually uh, can collect uh, uh, ideas, uh, scenarios, uh, and be you know, uh, very, very close to, to them. Uh, and think, uh, someone mentioned that the open educational resources as, as, uh, are as, as, as bricks. Uh, the way we see K-12 and digital education, it's more about uh, Lego boxes. So in addition to, to boxes, you also have some concrete educational scenarios defined. And I think it's, it's more important at this stage, not necessarily to have more open educational repositories, but actually to have really interesting educational scenarios and uh, uh, involving many different uh, technologies, not necessarily uh, only uh, open uh, digital documents, but also application. And it's, got, uh, it, it's also getting more and more complicated because it's much easier to create open e-textbooks with text than to uh, create or develop interactive application and then maintain, sustain you know, the, the, the software in, in the future. So it's not going to be... <laughs> an easy task, so, so I think we did the first step and now it's getting even more complicated because we believe that in the future uh, uh, kids, teachers will be more, more, more uh, mobile and, and uh, I think the, the, the learning uh, 
process will uh, be performed, not necessarily within schools, but, but in many different places. They're gonna have many gadgets, sensors, uh, they're gonna use it to more uh, interesting uh, open educational scenarios uh, will have the, the better for kids, the, the better for us. If you don't have any comments, um, let's maybe see whether the, any of the participants of the conference have any questions. Maybe you want us to clarify something? Oh, please, do we have? Hello, thank you very much. I found this so interesting. Um, my name is Barbara Ilowski from the United States, and I am an author of a university um, used open textbook, Introductory Statistics. And I um, really found it fascinating with what you were with what you were saying because I uh, am an, an early author, and I received a lot of um, chastising from colleagues who did not write a book and had never planned a book to write a book, but were angry that my book was open and free, and especially that we used the Creative Commons Attributions License, and it was published by Connections from Rice and um, then OpenStax College, and they were mad that I might be giving something away that somebody else could make money on, and I wouldn't, and what I found was it led to innovation so that the for-profit companies could do innovative work. But I was, I was curious um, uh, if you experienced the same that, that your colleagues actually from around the country felt that it was almost inappropriate to put your work up there for free for everyone. Unfortunately, yes, but they are not saying this in an open way. I would say um, in physics it's a little bit different. Uh, at our laboratory it says to work here you don't have to be crazy, but it helps. But th this is a little bit different story, but I face many times this situation that people who were writing the open text were complaining that some, that their friends were pointing their finger, fingers at them and saying, oh, you were just uh, uh, changing the market for the books that we are writing for the years. We got some expertise and we are making some living on this. And now you are introducing your own books. The answer is, so you have to have a better book. You need to have a better material. Oh, I would say much better than my open. Because my for free may be a little bit worse, but it's free. So the only way, if you want to compete with me, make something much, much better. You always get a chance. That's the simplest answer that I am giving to them. It's like they're complaining about my computer simulation. I'm doing computer simulations on some physics phenomena. And the guy's saying, oh, the, these particles are moving this way and it should go that way. I'm Im immediately saying, okay, I'm giving you a, a full code of my programming code, open code, and say, I don't need it. I don't know how to pro make a program. I am I, I'm not familiar with programming. So I'm saying, okay, so you have to find somebody else who will write the program for you. And and it should be a little bit better than mine, then, then it will work. If not, then it will. The, always the thing is, if somebody is telling you that it can be done in a better way, that's obvious. It's true. Of course it's true. But the problem is, is the person who is telling you this has any experience does he know how much time consuming is that? It's the same story. If I'm going for the class, I got a uh, one and a half an hour class, and somewhere they count these hours and they pay me salary. If I'm spending the hours talking uh, through the internet with the students, giving them advices and answering the questions, consulting them, nobody's counting my time and nobody wants to pay it for. So, you have to be a real teacher. That's the simple answer. <laughs> and, and, and for those people who are complaining, you can always say to them, I know that you are very smart. You are much better than I am. So mm -hmm. you can make a much better book and much better material. Yeah, but, but, but that's the thing we all, all, all know. If you are a scientist, that, that's a very 
hard profession because when you are moving around, you always meet the people who are smart, much smarter than you are, who are really clever, much wiser than you are, and you have to face it. That's true. That's the scientific world. My name is Dutra, I'm from Brazil, University of Sao Paulo. And I think although we have lots of very good quality resource all over the world, I think we need more local flavor resources. And to do that, we need more local creators or remixers or revisers. So to have more local revisers or remixers, we need a very easy tool to do that. I understand that you already have one, and I would like, uh, if you can, to share some experience of the teachers using this tool to revise it or mix the resources. Thank you. So I can make one comment that, uh, from our perspective uh, as our coalition, that's, for instance, the challenge with the uh, with the big open textbooks project, and this was sort of a debate on the approach, sort of between providing content or making content openly available, uh, that in the end the platform doesn't have an authoring tool. It's a it's a platform that lets you um, you know use resources but not reuse them as a teacher. And this is something, for instance, that I hope and and i know you you feel the same as as your institution but in the end that's not the decision yet of the government um to move in this regard and it's not a tech, there are technical aspects i agree when you say this has to be an easy tool uh you can also do it in a way that it's not easy and no one will want to touch it but um as christoph described a lot of the technical and interface issues have been solved and then it becomes sort of an issue of uh, educational policy which either assumes that you want to create a situation where you give teachers tools where you give them encouragement where you create programs where they become active in using resources and i really like your examples for instance from Belgium uh, of the class cement platform where they really try to work with the community of teachers to do that or, or you assume that that's maybe of secondary importance and I think I would describe this as a very big challenge for us in the coming years whether we can move the textbooks project in that direction but similarly in higher education whether we can for instance create some kind of a project uh, supported by the Ministry of Science that takes examples for instance from AGH because the the sort of the template is there how to do it and the tools are there uh, and how to scale it. So, I, uh, I didn't mention actually a uh, very very important thing uh, that in this project we actually started uh, uh, creating platform in the same time uh, we had uh, as I said, more than, than three or four hundred people uh, asking for tools for you know building the, the content. So that, that that was really you know a big challenge, and we we have realized that that many of them, really many of them, would like to use uh, uh, many tools that are using, like you know for instance Word, just to you know to collect quickly ideas and, and you know at least have you know the, uh, create some some, some text. So uh, the platform has been, de has been uh, designed in a way to be connected with many authoring or editorial tools. So uh, my message is simply don't try to come up with new tools for, for authors because they actually uh, uh, may not accept you know, new interfaces. Simply you know, uh, spend your time and do as many integration uh, activities as possible. So use as many tools as people are using and connect or try to use those, those tools to, to get you know, uh, sources from, from different uh, places. And uh, if we uh, didn't uh, 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 go that way, I think it wouldn't be possible with a limited time to c collect you know, uh, uh, inputs for, from authors, uh, editors, because it was simply you know, too much. I mean, uh, at the end we have thousands of, of objects. For, for multimedia and, and interactive uh, components, it's really a bit uh, compli uh, complicated because you simply uh, not only 
writing a text uh, paragraph, but you actually write a piece of software. Uh, for the multimedia, it's also uh, another story because you actually have to create the, the multimedia, the video in an appropriate uh, format and, and deliver the, 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 the file. But then uh, keeping open standards and interfaces, you actually can uh, promote and integrate many uh, tools um, available today. So. If I can add, in, in less used languages, like Polish as well, it's a very difficult language, probably like 10th or 9th the most difficult, probably, in the world. So uh, a lot of those resources that are in Polish, they happen in very different platforms, like they happen on local computers of teachers in Word or maybe in Google Docs. So it's very difficult to to make those resources, to bring them somewhere up, so make platforms. And this is a very difficult question because most of the OER platforms build locally. Like the digital, I like, I love digital school platform, which is like well based on your user experience uh, methods. You you worked out a lot of different difficulties that that wasn't uh, that, that weren't worked out before in a, in a different platforms in Poland. But still, most of them are not very simple to use for teachers. So if they make their local in local language, their the resources they are using the, the 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 best tools they can have, which is Google Docs, prob Google Docs probably, or Microsoft Word, or maybe like in Europe right now, learning apps. If you know learning apps for for a lot of teachers, and this was translated in a few other languages, so right now it's in, in Polish as well, and uh, and this is one difficulty we have that most of the OER projects are not. Uh, ready for a mass scale use because the interfaces are not good enough. Uh, I like uh, Tutori, the, uh, the, which is like the, the author of one of the German platform is right here probably, which is based on a very simple idea of just forking the resources. Um, I want to meet Joran personally probably, you see he's somewhere here. Uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, most of teachers, they are afraid of making their resources public in their languages because they are not good enough. So uh, this is one case uh, with the being a very good author. They want to be a very good author. They want to publish their, maybe not a textbook, but just a part of the resources. But they are making it just in a draft version. So it's ready for their pupils. It's ready for their friends, but it's not ready to be published online. And this is where policy should go and try to fix that because it's not just about making the research open, but helping them, giving their, them, them some kind of a support, different in different countries probably, uh, to make this the last mile, to publish these resources, to maybe correct their mistakes, to make the redaction, the end process, editing process, and then you can publish a very good resources. And this is like the shift from what you are taking. They are making a lot of different stuff. Most of them would be just flood, flooding the, 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 the platform. And there's the, the space where we are not covering right now, making the last edits for the teachers because they are not able, especially K-12 education uh, teachers, they are not able to edit themselves the last uh, the last parts of the resources to make this good, good enough to be publishing, and it's, if it's not good enough, they are afraid of publishing, of course, and they are not making their resources open. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, uh, we uh, we had many discussions, and uh, uh, we also asked uh, actually teachers and 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 kids uh, what are the, the the key features you would like to see uh, on a platform. And they actually uh, uh, didn't point or ask for, for editorial uh, tools. They actually uh, ask for simple uh, notes they can make, uh, uh, you know, on, on a text. So we uh, uh, we we've discussed this scenario and, and end up with the the, the uh, relatively uh, simple feature, uh, which uh, gives you uh, an ability to to put. Uh, uh, any link you want to your own uh, resources and with the the, the cloud-based services you can actually quite easily uh, create the additional material in PowerPoint publish or create a video put on a YouTube and you can simply link with the, the core uh, material your additional uh, resources and create kind of your own e-textbooks on your account so instead of changing, you know, the, the editing in, uh, text, you, you can simply you, you fork it or you add, the, you know, as many additional resources as you want. So that, that that's the, the current status. Maybe we will add, you know, more social editorial tools, 
but uh, I don't think it, it's that critical. I mean, there are, I believe more in, in integration and the, the, the added values, uh, services, and synergy out of uh, such integration. Okay, it's time to finish our session. I think it's very interesting how we, in the end, started talking about practices and, and interfaces and, and tools that help them. I personally am a bit fixated on policy issues. I have a goal for Poland to have a general open policy for resources. We made a big step, I forgot to mention last year, that the funds from the European Social Fund, which is a really big funding source of European funds, especially for education, which goes into to billions of euros, billions of zlotys, introduce an open licensing rule. That's a big win for us, but I'm happy to see that others will focus on the non-policy parts because of which this will all work. So just to end, I'd like to ask you, can you make some final comments? I would be very happy to hear what, from your perspective, are the key things to do. Do you want to start? Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, I want to say that uh, this conference is uh, mostly devoted to, you know, for talking about uh, contribution of uh, open education, uh, open uh, research, uh, op uh, open data, open publication to research and education itself. Uh, however, uh, what is very important to say that uh, uh, it's uh, well, open data, uh, open publication, first of all, open educational resources it is uh, well ca kind of building block of. Uh, future of the new production revolution of uh, open society and uh, we all know uh, it's great input to the new education, new communication, uh, new energy logistic uh, manufacturing production. So I would only want to say that it's uh, well part of big change uh, 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 described uh, among many authors by Jeremy Rifkin in his famous book uh, Zero Marginal Cost Economy. Uh, and uh, especially I suspect that uh, the, uh, the most important motif of ALEC uh, action is uh, contribution of open education and open science to open society. Uh, open democratic society. Uh, the main conclusion is about the cooperation. Let's cooperate, not uh, just sharing the materials. They are by definition open, so you can openly access them. But let's share between the teachers and the universities the best practices and also the software, the IT platforms, all this stuff that can help to create the open access materials. Really. The future is in the very close cooperation. Thank you. So uh, I wouldn't be uh, probably even working with, you if, with Alec if I wasn't a fan of policies as well. But um, uh, but uh, uh, my conclusion, not only from this panel, but maybe for last years working both in, in, in Polish projects and trying to figure out what, what are the best practices from around the world, from open education resources, uh, projects all around the world, both governmental, non-governmental, at universities, that uh, it's one, it's cooperation, of course, and the second one, we, we need to be more flexible. And I think this is uh, part of what we will be talking at the OER Policy Forum uh, Thursday, that there are very different paths we need to consider how it's the best way to success at openness at university or at k-12 education or at the government project, or if you are just making your, I don't know, school open policy or one school making being open by a teacher or by a uh, by, by, by maybe a group of, of parents who want to change something in their school so there are very different ways uh, to get things done in openness and I think we are in, uh, we should discuss more different ways more local more flexible to different needs of different authors different groups of actors in openness and so this is, I think, what's, what's already happening, that we are not just talking about resources, not about just the technology or money or policy, we're figuring, figuring out what are the best uh, ways to, uh, to even make it better. 
my, uh, my conclusion. Uh, I think that the, the education, teaching, learning is an emotional thing, and uh, I think uh, my advice is don't put technology on, uh, as a first place. Uh, uh, at the end, you know, humans are uh, in, in the loop, so uh, technology is there and could be you know, as transparent as, as, as uh, or should be as transparent as, as possible. Uh, collaborate, share experiences, uh, and really carefully uh, listen to, 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 to kids because they really have uh, great ideas, you know, how to use technologies better than us. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I hope this has... <laughs> been an inspiring discussion that highlighted both dry policies and uh, interesting personal experiences and the interfaces that run between us. Thank you very much and please enjoy your coffee break. <laughs>